Hello, I'm Lynn Samuel and today I'm uh, interviewing Oliver Colville, uh, who is Member of Parliament for Plymouth Sutton and Devonport. Um, this is part of a uh, documentary put together and scripted by George Evans as part of his uh, television arts degree at Plymouth University. Oliver, thank you very much for it's a sparing pleasure. us uh, part of your valuable time. Uh, I'd like to lead off with one or two topical questions. The first being, why do you think David Cameron took such an enormous risk in um, calling a referendum on the UK's um, membership of the EU? I think he had no option in that, uh, because it had become a really big running sore in British society, where there were a lot of vociferous people mm. talking about how they wanted to have a say on our future membership of the European Union and therefore I think that having made that pledge uh, to the uh, public um, I don't think he had any option but to carry that through and of course there have been an increasingly big issue of where people felt mm. that a Conservative government in 2010 was going to have a referendum uh, about the Lisbon Treaty mm. but unfortunately um, everybody else has signed the deal by the time or everybody has signed the deal so he had no option but to press ahead and then say, okay, fine, we'll have a referendum subsequently about all of that too. So that were the, those were the problems, really. When you say vociferous people, vociferous MPs in his government, or uh, well, the public no, this, this was before we got elected in 2010, oh, right. when there was the referendum, when there was a signing of the Lisbon Treaty. You may remember Gordon Brown went and signed it. I do he did it completely away from anybody else as mm. well, because mm. he was rather ashamed to actually go and do it. Mm. And so therefore, I think that by the time we came to power, the coalition government came to power, yes. there was no choice but to actually go ahead with it, mm. but to make a pledge in the run-up to the 2015 election, mm -hmm. that we would end up by having a referendum and ask the British people as to what they felt. Mm -hmm. And one of the really big issues, I would argue, is that uh, governments uh, have a tendency or have a reputation for not delivering upon what they said. But this mm -hmm. was such a fundamental issue, I don't think he had any option. And I was very supportive mm -hmm. of him having that referendum too. But do you think that having set store by his um, uh, meetings with uh, EU politicians to try and get a better deal, which in fact uh, stumbled yes. or possibly failed, uh, that he then painted himself into a corner uh, and, and had to call the, uh, well, you know, the he, referendum? He, yeah, he'd already announced that he was going to do the referendum, so therefore he went and talked then to, mm -hmm. uh, to the European partners right. uh, in the place and I don't think he had any choice mm. and there were some things which he ended up by getting out of it in all fairness about mm. benefits and uh, EU uh, nationals being able to claim all those benefits yes. as well um, and but it wasn't perceived to be strong enough uh, to an awful lot of people so mm. I don't think he had um, whilst I think he did his level best to try and negotiate it uh, I obviously the British public decided that they weren't happy with that yes. and uh, during the Brexit campaign, if I may say so, was quite well organised and very, you know, uh, and able to deliver upon their messages. Mm. And if I have one criticism of it, I don't think that the Remain campaign mm. talked enough about some of the positive benefits that were happening. It seemed that those of us on the Remain campaign yes. were permanently on the back foot. So you th what you're saying effectively is that it was an inevitable uh, process that led up to it, but do you think that by nature he was a gambler? No, or I, I people don't have said that, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think he is a gambler. I don't, I don't know whether he's a gambler or not. I'd be quite wrong for me to say that. But do I think that uh, he had no choice mm. uh, as to how this went? And I don't think anybody thought, even on the... Um, even on the uh, Get Out campaign, yes. they felt that they were always going to win this. It was a foregone conclusion. Yes. I think it's quite interesting to look at here in Plymouth that I would argue that in places like Pebble and Compton, which mm. is a bit more of a middle class kind of area, yes. they voted just about to remain in. Yes. Secondly, though, those people who, and obviously around Drake, where there's a large student population, they voted to remain in. 
But then, if you go to, down to uh, Devonport, or for that matter, into Efford, yes. they basically fundamentally to come out. So right. those people who don't perhaps have the, um, uh, who, who aren't as qualified, yes. uh, you know, and have the academic qualifications, mm. um, decided that they felt that actually we should come out. And that was where I think we found the issue. Mm. And even remember, Nigel Farage on the night and when it was the early stages of it yes. said I don't think we've done enough in order to win this and then I had to say we'd rather have to eat his own words <laughs> so, from his point of view yes, actually, yes. then admit that actually they had been able to win it. As a Remainer, yeah. uh, to wrap this question up, uh, do you still think that it was calamitous? Um, I think I, I, I campaigned my vote to remain in. Yes. Uh, and I make no bets about that. I did it for a whole series of different reasons. Bangkok, my largest employer in the constituency, yes. ended up by writing a letter to the Times. Mm. Um, the people of Princess Yachts explained to me that they were very concerned about having to pay a surcharge for exporting their their boats to the kind of boats that, if I might say so, neither George Osborne nor Peter Mandelson should be seen on. Uh, <laughs> they decided that uh, they were that they would get all uh, markedly managing director of, of the place in the chief executive actually said that. And then of course I got a large, we have a global reputation in this city yes. for marine science engineering research. Of course. And what was really important was the research organisations like Plymouth Marine Laboratories, the yes. Marine Biological Association, yes. no doubt the aquarium and also the university yes. felt it was very important that we didn't unpick all of those close relationships with those research institutes which is just so desperately important so um, I think that that was what happened and that probably we didn't actually get our message across mm. clearly enough but we have now decided as a country we're going to come out um, we've now triggered article 50 which is our notice of divorce um, and now we've got to actually see as to how this all works um, uh, as well and there will be a number of things which I will be pressing for, not least of which will be to enhance our science base and to make sure there is the money which goes into uh, our science base so mm. they can carry on doing the research. But they also haven't just got to now talk to other European research institutes, but they've got to talk to America and they've also got to talk to South Korea and places like that too. Yes, of course. As far as, so that I think is very, very, very important. Well, that, but that leads on quite nicely to um, how the West Country in the past has benefited yes. from uh, European Union uh, development and I funding. Uh, now, uh, do, you, do you see this having an impact in future on Plymouth? Um, I, I, potentially I do, and well, let me explain why. You're quite right that a lot of uh, money has come out of the European Union. I mean, those people who were on the Brexiteer side will no doubt argue that this was money which the British government ended up by paying into the European funds yes, yes. and it was then down to the Europeans to make that decision as to how that money got spent and what projects yeah. they were going to were going to deliver. Yes. But one of the really big problems which I'm afraid this part of the world has had over, over the 13 years before the Conservative or Coalition government came into mm. power was of course Labour doesn't really have any kind of a massive political footprint here. They had in 1997, which was the height of Tony Blair's activities, yes. they had four parliamentary seats, Farmouth and Camborne, mm. the Plymouth Sutton seat, which eventually mm. I ended up by winning yes. Plymouth Devonport, yes. and Exeter as well. Right. Those have all rather gone, in fact all of them have gone now, with the exception of the Exeter seat, which is still the Labour. So the issue will be, should there ever be, and I hope there isn't for a long, long time, mm. a future Labour government in power, their priority will not be about putting money down into here. And so the one good thing which ended up by happening out of the European Union was that they decided they were going to support some of the projects which we had. Mm. Whether or not even the project would have actually taken place if Europe hadn't been there, I don't know. Yes, well, I've read a figure um, of around two billion pounds being poured into the uh, West Country, yep. mostly in Cornwall, yep. I believe. Yes. Um, and the irony was that Cornwall voted, I think, to to come out. Come out. But you know, one of the things I'm not in the business of doing is 
is saying to voters, no, no, I'm afraid I think we've got that wrong, and so therefore we're going to ignore it. So I think the Prime Minister has done exactly the right thing yes. of saying, OK, that's the decision that's been taken. Yeah. We now have to deliver on behalf of the people too. And so that is now, I think, what the Conservative government is mm. seeking to try and do. And this week, of course, is very, very apt. Is this a sensitive and dangerous question to finish off God. with? Um, do you think that the United Kingdom government will actually match the funding that the West Country has become accustomed to over the recent years? I think that is very difficult to know. But what I would say as a Conservative Member of Parliament, working with my fellow Conservative Members of Parliament here, we will be pressing them to do it. And we do remind them on quite a regular basis, Ministers, we do remind them that actually we are the majority in the House of, uh, in the government, for the government in, in the House of Commons as yes. well. So there are 56, I think you'll find, Conservative MPs, and frankly the majority is only around about the number 12. Yes. And so therefore, I think that we need to carry on pressing that case. I'm the chairman of the all-party parliamentary group for Peninsula Rail, oh, yes. and rest assured, I keep on reminding ministers that Plymouth is in Portsmouth, not 20 minutes away from Bristol, yes. and what is more, uh, we need to make sure we have got good infrastructure, mm -hmm. good rail infrastructure into the city, and we're making progress on that. Mm -hmm. And it was really unfortunate what happened at Dawlish, uh, with it being walked away in 2014. Yes. But we are using that as an opportunity to carry on saying to government every single moment we possibly can yes. that actually they need to make sure we have got those, that infrastructure in place. And I'm delighted that the Department for Transport is actually taking that very seriously. And hopefully we'll have a result about all this in 2019. Thank you. Shall we leave Brexit for a moment and move over to the House of Lords? Yes. Uh, which, in George's question here, uh, tells us that it's the largest parliamentary democracy, uh, chamber rather, in any democracy, and it's also unelected. Why does it continue to defy uh, re reform? Well, the Conservative Party doesn't have uh, an elected 